OK, that's great. Thanks very much indeed. Right, welcome everybody. Yeah, a rainy evening. Um, what better way to pass your time than here at the Sustainable Task Force meeting? <laughs> OK, so thanks very much for, for sparing the time and um, welcome. So, um, Christy, have we any apologies? We have apologies from Anya Miller of the Youth Senate, oh, yeah. Mike Hogg, Chester Residents Association Group, Rob Pickering from British Cycling, Andy Farrell, Chester Bid, and uh, Claire Roberts, representing the Poverty and Truth Coordinator, has left the organisation now, and I think that post is still vacant. And uh, Council Officer Lynn Mackay is also absent this evening as well. OK, thanks very much indeed. OK, so we'll um, we'll do some introductions. We, we have, even though we probably know each other reasonably well, um, we've got some new people on the call tonight, but also we usually introduce ourselves for the purpose of the recording so that it's not detached from the, the minutes. So I'll run down the um, the minutes of the last meeting in the sequence of the, the names there, and then I'll ask for any that um, I've missed. So uh, Tamara. Uh, Tamara Huntley, Sustainability Officer from the University of Chester. Thanks, Tammy. Roy Newton. Hi, I'm Roy Newton. I'm the Transport and Investment Director at Cheshire and Warrington Lap. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephen Perry. Uh, Stephen Perry. I'm the, um, in this context, I'm chairing the Upton Pilot Team and also the Emergency Active, Active Travel Lane Team. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Bernadette Bailey. Good evening, Bernadette Bailey, Programme Lead for Living Well for Longer and representing Cheshire CCG on climate change. Excellent, thanks very much. Uh, David Beer. David not here tonight. I think he was saying that he probably wouldn't be, so. Um, I'll Mike double check my emails and put it in the chat. Yeah, and um, Mike has sent his apologies. So Andy Farrell's on holiday. And your Miller sense apologies. So Alex Bell. Hi, I'm Alex Bell and I'm a member of the Youth Senate. Great. OK, short and sweet. Thanks, Alex. Uh, David Whitehead. Hi, uh, David Whitehead. I'm chair of Huntington Parish Council. OK, great. Thanks. Uh, Rob sends his apologies. Mike Garrett. Hi, I'm Mike Garrett, local resident, transport consultant, representing freight interests and helping on the Borton Corridor and uh, Andy Farrell City Centre um, team. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Cathy Partington. Cathy here. OK, um, we make sure to Claire, who's not here. Nicholas says. Marketing Cheshire. Nope, OK, uh, Peter Bulmer. Now Peter's usually here. John, do you know Peter's attending at all? No, he can't attend this one. He can't attend, right, yeah. OK. Um, uh, Peter Bulmer, Stephen Hughes. Hi, yes, um, Stephen Hughes here, and I'm representing uh, the Chester Sustainability Forum. <laughs> Thank you. Nicola, you're screen, you, you popped up now. Do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, yeah. I was uh, trying to multitask at the moment. So I've got a <laughs> small child that needs to go to bed and have his tea and everything else. So Nicola said from Martin Cheshire. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. If you'd bring him into the meeting, that will put him to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't mean that. Um, so moving on to so, um, Gemma Davies. Hello everybody, um, I'm Gemma Davis and I'm the Director for Economy and Housing at Cheshire West and Chester Council, um, which also includes planning and climate change. Thanks very much. Um, Andrew Blackburn, yep. Yeah. Good evening, Andrew Blackburn, Decarbonising Transport Officer and my two little ones probably will make an appearance at some point when they're going to bed. <laughs> That's good. Uh, and Will Pearson. Hi there, folks. I'm Will Pearson. I'm the Climate Change Strategy Manager at Cheshire West and Chester Council. 
Excellent, thank you. Uh, Christy? Uh, Christy Littler, Transport Manager, Cheshire West and Chester Council. Okay, and John. John Beckett? Yeah, Vice Chairman, uh, Chris Wood Parish Council and Joint Lead of the South East Chester Pilot with Peter Bournemouth. Okay, great. Thanks very much indeed. Now, is there anybody of our normal call membership who I've missed? Me. Hello, Anne Helen. I can see your picture there. I, <laughs> I was late, I think, last time, which might be why. Okay. So, uh, uh, Helen Tandy, um, Director of Eco Communities and uh, Lead of Friends of the Earth Chester and District and on the Central Chester Group with Andy Farrell as well. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Might need your help in a moment, so thank you for that. Oh, no, no, this is a feeding back of Andy's section. I saw all those emails. Nobody was <laughs> going to be here. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Anybody else that I've missed? No? Okay, great. Thanks very much for that. So, um, at item four, I usually ask if anybody's got any declarations of interest for any of the topics that are on tonight's agenda. Can I make that known? OK, thanks very much for that. And then item five, we go to the minutes of the last meeting, which seems quite a while ago, doesn't it? 8th of April, <clears throat> but um, a quite lengthy meeting, lots of lots of going on. Um, so can I ask you first if there's anything you you feel should be corrected in those minutes? OK, thanks very much for that. We'll take those as a record then of that meeting. Um, Christy, thank you very much indeed. Perfect set. Um, are there any matters of rising that, uh, sorry, matters arising that people would like to raise? I'm about to raise one myself. Is there anything else on there that people feel they would like to raise? Most of the things are on tonight's agenda anyway, but um, I'm happy to to look at that. OK, thanks. So um, I just want to kind of pause on one of the items that was, was um, mentioned right at the end of the meeting last time um, when I discussed the the way in which we might work with council in with regards to um, the, the pilots and the work that is produced and how we move forward and how we kind of get some insight into whether the work is feasible and how we can actually move forward with this. So um, there's been quite a few discussions on this and I'm very, very grateful for various people in, in um, the council for helping me take this forward. Um, if I can just go back just a little bit, though, before I kind of summarise the the outcome of the meetings that I've had. Um, if you go back to the beginning of these meetings and let's say from Task Force meeting two, because the first one really was just kind of agenda setting. Um, you remember in that meeting we had an open house and we divided up into three groups and we asked for opinions from people of where they felt um, there were areas that we really needed to kind of look at. Um, with some you know, reasonable haste. And out of that, we took four pilot groups. And over the course of the next two meetings, we set those pilot groups up with the people that you now know well in those, and they formed teams. And they took those particular areas forward so that they could work on the suggestions that were coming forward. I think the thing that's been particularly impressing um, over the last few meetings where we've seen the outputs from these groups is the quality of the work that they're doing. And if you like, the the urgency with which they're undertaking this this particular um, project that they've got. And this could be whether it's the, the Travel Lanes project, and we've seen plenty of output from Stephen's group, or whether it's one of the other four pilots. They're all moving ahead quite quickly. And this inevitably brings the um, the problem or the situation of what do we do then? Where do we go with the outputs of these particular pilot groups and how do they get either proposed or even implemented? Where do we do that? How do we do that? So at the last meeting, I proposed the idea of what I called at the time an interface group. And uh, I probably won't continue using that name, but that's the way I referred to it at the time. And the idea behind this group is that we could actually meet with people who were representative of the council who could actually look at the ideas that we had and give us some comments on them, you know, whether or not, hey, that's a great idea. We really like that. Or 
ah, right, well, okay, we've got this scheme going in, that's probably not appropriate at this time, let's try and think of another way of doing it, and so on. So that was the, the whole point of my working with um, the council to try and find a way forward to overcome this particular, um, what I see as a, a, as a gap in our <laughs> structure. So I had a meeting with um, Charlie Seward, who is the deputy director of the council um, last week, I think it was, or a week before, and very good meeting, excellent. And the, the outcome of that is that the council are appointing Kevin Riley from WSP, who is going to act as that interface person between the council and each of the pilot groups separately. And the point of that is to actually do more or less, as I suggested just a few moments ago, is actually to work with the groups and, if you like, bring the products up to scratch to see whether or not they can be presented and what the most appropriate way of funding is and how that actually goes forward from there. So um, I think that's a really good move. I think it's really going to help us and give us the confidence that our ideas are actually now going to be able to go a step further and be um, looked at. Uh, so um, I'm quite pleased with that. I'm very proud to be able to kind of present that to you now as a, as a, as a way forward for these. Um, and I think at this point, I'd probably like to hand over to um, Gemma Davies, who's here representing Charlie Seward tonight and who can perhaps add a little bit of um, more detail to that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Garfield. Yeah, I mean, um, as, as Garfield has set out, really, I think you know, we, we recognised that we needed to um, fulfil and bring in that additional sort of resource and capacity um, to act as that sort of, as you described it, Garfield, that sort of interface um, and to bring that sort of, I guess, technical um, uh, sense checking and and expertise really into into the ideas and, and proposals that that each of the pilot leads are uh, and pilot groups are are coming forward with. So the idea is very much that Kevin will work with you, um, and um, the first thing will be to obviously meet with um, both Garfield and and each of the other pilot leads um which we would like to do over the next couple of couple of weeks really if, if diaries allow um so kevin is is now sort of on board if you like um uh, christy and i have got a, a a catch up with him with him tomorrow um and um he has he has worked with chester before um he he was involved in um the first one city plan and i think brings his experience and knowledge not only of chester but elsewhere as well um uh, which will hopefully be of be of benefit um to 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 the groups and to to taking this forward um and i think you know without without repeating what garfield said i think really i think should be a value to 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 help with that sort of deliverability viability type conversations and then being that you know interface to say okay where can these projects now go to, to to deliver them um so myself and charlie christy and and will you know will be very much still working with with you with kevin um on that on that process really so um hopefully that is helpful as a bit more bit more information like i say i think the next key thing will be to meet with each of the the groups um to be able to um have those introductions and to start to start that 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 relationship really and that work um and i think the other benefit then is obviously helping with that integration um of the projects between the work streams between the pilots but also with the things that are going on as well um within that, that sort of wider city centre transport um and, and one city plan piece of work as well um uh, that that is that is sort of ongoing and, and obviously reviewing the one city plan at the moment so um yeah hopefully that's hopefully that's helpful garfield is a bit more information but if there's any questions or comments happy to take those okay thanks thanks Gemma. and you feel that kevin will have, be able to kind of reach out to all the various areas in the council that, that may need um reaching to 
Yeah, so that will be part of his his remit, and obviously myself and, and Christy and others will will support that as well. Um, you know, he he's very aware of the, the the wide remit, if you like, that that this sort of brings in, and um, that 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 will absolutely be part of that part of that role. Great. Okay. Thank you. So, colleagues, um, before I go on to the second part of that um, item six, is there a, are there any questions for either myself or for Gemma? here at this point. So Mike. Yeah, hi, uh, thank you for that. Uh, hi Gemma, um, just a clarification point really. I just wondered how um, Kevin will relate to Mott McDonald, given they're your sort of framework consultants on traffic matters. Yeah, so um, I mean, we have, um, we have relationships with a number of consultants um, and Kevin's very aware of the consultant teams that we have working on projects and on the framework at the moment. Um, so we've spoken about about that and part of the role will need to be to um, coordinate and talk to other other consultants. So, you know, I think having the clarity of Kevin's role alongside the, the remits of those other consultants um, has been you know, fully explained and um, and you know it was part of our role as well as offices of the council to make that work. Okay, thank you. Right, thanks so much. Any further questions? Okay, thanks. I think that um, that brings me on, if you like, to the the second part of the um, that item six, which is the the terms of reference. And I think I've, I briefly touched on this last time um, that. Um, in my discussions with the, the council, it was made clear that um, the task force is a long term um, structure and um, not a kind of an immediate task and finish group, which is fine. And I think we're all welcomed up because that gives us the chance to, to, to do some projects which take a little longer than the, the normal ones. But at the same time, there comes a time when you have to actually kind of say, well, is it, is it doing its job? Is it actually um, reaching? The benefits that we expected it to do. So um, I'm suggesting that uh, at our anniversary, which is um, in November, we will have an appraisal and we'll, we'll look at the projects that we have in hand and where they're up to and how they've got on and the work of the task force, whether or not that needs to change, whether or not we need to bring in any other different dimensions um, in order to, to achieve what we're hoping to achieve. Um, and in the terms of reference, I'd like to build that in. I'd also like to build in things like the re-election of a chair. You don't want me talking at you for years, do you? And other things which I think are part of a kind of standard agenda for an annual review of a particular body of work. So I'll be presenting those at the next meeting after discussions with um, the, the legal team at the council to make sure we, we say everything correctly and get it right. Um, and I'd be welcome. I'd welcome comments from people either directly now or to me via email. I think you all know my email now, but um, you're more than welcome to um, send comments through to me so that we can incorporate those into a revision of the um, of the terms of reference, which will of course include this link and this kind of interface with the council is now part of the standard operating way that the the task force runs. So, Stephen Hughes, yeah. Very sensible. Yeah, I'd li I like the idea a lot. Um, one thing that I'd suggest, feel free to disagree, would be that that, that meeting where there is a, an appraisal and, a, and potentially a re-election is separate from the standard running of meetings, because it sounds like it could easily take up the entire meeting itself. So, um, yeah, the only suggestion would be that it would be separate to the standard running of meetings. Okay, point taken. That's a good one as well. Yes. OK, thank you for that. OK, any other comments at all on anything I've raised just now? OK, well, thanks, Gemma. Thanks for your input and thanks, everybody. We'll move on with that then. So um, moving down to item seven, we've got the first of our presentations from our various groups. So um, I'll just sh share these slides. Just give me a moment and then I'll ask Stephen to um um 
And hang on a second, let's just get the slideshow underway. There we go. And right, Stephen. Thank, thanks. If you just hold it on that slide for the moment, thanks, Garfield. Well, good okay. evening, everybody, and welcome to those people I don't know. Um, but it's nice to see some new faces. Uh, the uh, Garfield referred to the uh, January, uh, sorry, the uh, November meeting and the um, December meeting when we had a very useful workshop. And then in the January meeting, um, most of the teams we're now working with have set up. And in particular, the team that I'm managing in this context, the Emergency Active Travel Lane Working Group was set up and it was commissioned to be to provide an independent review of the travel lanes, both in the Vaughton area and on the Liverpool Road, and to come up with a recommendation to either retain, remove or adapt those uh, travel lanes. Um, and for those that haven't sort of been in this full process so far, uh, since that date, the group that I manage has met every week for at least two hours. Uh, and for the first uh, three or four weeks, we look very critically at the travel lanes on both locations. And with quite a degree of uh, concern and heartache, nonetheless, we came to the recommendation that they should be paused. And uh, we're grateful that the council recognized that uh, recommendation and they were paused as from the beginning of March. We've continued, though, uh, to, to collect data, to get external ideas, to review ideas. And at the last meeting in April, we presented a pretty detailed recommendation of our thoughts for, for changes and improvements that we felt would make a difference along the westbound lane from uh, for, for coming to the city. And we extended our thinking not just for the current traffic lanes as they've been painted on the ground, as it were, but looked at the full route from uh, the, the uh, Sainsbury's roundabout into the Bars roundabout, which we generally call the uh, the Borton Corridor. Now, at the last, some people may not have seen that presentation, but I'd happily send it round to anybody that hasn't. But it was a fairly detailed and I think quite a positively provocative uh, set of recommendations. Um, but we intentionally talked about creating space for a travel lane with no recommendation at this stage, whether that's a bus lane, a bus and cycle lane, a two-way cycle lane. We have views on that, but that's obviously something we'd like to discuss in more detail when the time is right. Um, so if I move on to the next slide, please. Um, what we're going to do today is fill in the, uh, the next part of the conversation. And next slide, possibly. Yeah, I know. Oh. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, so what we're going to talk about tonight is we're going to do the, 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 in the final bit of our thinking. So we talked about the westbound lane at the last meeting and tonight we're going to focus more on the eastbound lane. I'll just wait till the slides come up for me. Hang on a second, let's try those Don't again. Worry. Okay, I need to start that again. I'm not sure why these slides aren't coming up. Okay, oh. well, well, while I'm waiting, I just want to say I'm delighted with the news about Kevin Riley. Um, it's a very positive move, so thank you for taking the initiatives, everybody involved. Uh, myself and some others work with Kevin in the creation of the local cycling and walking infrastructure plans, so he's, a, he's not an entirely new face to us, so we welcome him into this, uh, into this process and uh, look forward to having an interface with him on that, uh, on that matter. How are we doing, Garth? Are we? Hang on a second, I'm just going to... I'm just going to my backup decks just to see. Uh, something else to say is that we're delighted that Alex uh, Bell joined our team in the last couple of weeks. Alex is here tonight as a member of the uh, Youth Senate, uh, and that's really nice to have somebody that brings down the average age considerably of our group. So <laughs> welcome to Alex. Hmm. This is really very odd. I'm not sure why these aren't coming up. Just hang on a moment. Sorry. They're on my screen, but they don't seem to be showing on yours, so I won't be a second. We've not had any problems over the previous seven weeks, so I'm not quite sure what, what's up now. Um, let's try again. <laughs> Hmm. 
Okay, is that open now? Yeah, the, the 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 that's the first page is up, but it's it's not in presentation format. It's just in view format. But that would work if that's the only way of doing it. To no, we, do, we, do we have the technology. Ah, magic. Okay, so let's let's hope we're there. So the uh, the first uh, half dozen slides are going to be talking about our view now on the eastbound um, uh, route out of the city along the A51, which is essentially between the Bars Roundabout and what we've been calling the Bill Smith Gyratory, and then along the A5115 onto the, uh, the Hamburger Roundabout. When I've done that, Mike Garrett is going to talk about to some initial interpretation analysis from the origin and destination data that I've referred to in previous meetings, uh, but that arrived with us about a couple of weeks ago and we've been working on that. I think in a brief comment on communication, uh, a positive statement about working with the Southeast Chester on the Borton Corridor, and then uh, one slide on next steps. So if we could go on to the next slide, please, uh, Garfield. I should be there. No, it's not. Um, should I should I try taking control? Will that will that work? Sure, oh, no, there we are. Oh, that's it. That's okay. Uh, the 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 recommendations on the westbound route, as I say, I think were quite creative and quite challenging. The options for the eastbound route are far less clear, a less clear cut than those we presented last uh, last time. Uh, the fact that traffic splits as it's heading out of town. Uh, for all traffic, including buses, creates uh, a certain disruption in flow. And there's no perfect solution for cyclists heading out, again, because you've got the split in the road and there's no real space for cyclists, but I'll come back to that in a minute. And although the canal towpath offers uh, options for cyclists heading out of town, uh, it's OK for the A51, but it creates problems trying to get back onto the A5115. But again, I'll come back to those in details as we proceed. Next slide, please. The bus lane. Uh, Obviously, we've been talking about travel lanes, but at the end of the day, we have to decide what we use any lane for. Our strong view is that there's significantly less benefit in having a bus lane on the eastbound route. Uh, and I'm talking specifically, as I say, between the uh, the Bars Roundabout and the uh, Bill Smith Gyratory. We feel that stretch is relatively short and the, the segments of, uh, uh, of bus lane are themselves very fragmented. Buses have to change lane as they coming to the split in the road between A51 and A515. And many, indeed the majority of buses do have to cross that uh, that lane in order to get into the right lane to continue towards the same roundabout. And we also feel that the travel time incentive is a less of an issue. Uh, another specific point is traffic tends to back up fairly, on, uh, fairly early on along that uh, travel lane as installed by Waitrose with buses and cars trying to cross each other to get into Waitrose or to continue, etc. That could be marginally improved maybe by um, altering the facing of the, the lights at Waitrose so people cannot exit and turn right, but uh, that would halve the dwelling time. But again, that, that has issues that might not uh, be satisfactory. I think the other thing that I've thought since creating this slide is that I don't think there's an example of an outbound travel lane, a uh, bus lane in Chester. If we think of the bus lanes, on the roads that do exist on the Wrexham Road, the Saltney Road and the Sealand Road, unless I'm very wrong, there's not a, an outward bound lane. So maybe there's a precedence there. Anyway, our thoughts are it's a far less convincing case. Next slide, please. We talk about on road cycle lanes. Uh, again, for those that are not too familiar with the whole area that I've been speaking about, the sort of uh, triangular shape to the middle right of the picture, where effectively the A51 splits and the A5115 comes down to the bottom right. That's what we call in the Bill Smith's gyratory. Um, and putting in a mandatory, i.e. an, an obliged uh, cycle lane along that route is not easy. There's not the space to do it the whole way. Um, and in but specifically, as they approach what we call in the gy gyratory, that uh, triangular area, there's there's really no answer but to try to find a way of making that uh, that whole area calm and respectful for all road users there's just not space for dedication of a cycle lane at all. Uh, the cycle lane is possible along the uh, A51 and where the arrow ends is about where the, a cycle lane starts. Um, but the uh, the need for a cycle route along the A5115, the bottom right hand line, is again, it's debatable, but 
it would also depend on what we decide to do with the travel lane that we suggest we could bring on a on a westbound basis. If that westbound travel lane coming into the city was a two lane, two way cycle lane, then obviously that would provide a solution. But that's yet to be decided. So those are the sort of that's the picture for on road cycle lanes uh, and no easy solution, I'm afraid. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a bit of bit more detail I could have added. Um, again, looking at, at trying to put a cycle lane from the bars roundabout uh, along that route. There's lots of reasons. There's the there's the uh, parking on the left hand side that wouldn't we have to completely change the parking arrangements, which probably wouldn't be acceptable. You'd have to take away some of the pavement. There is the option as you go past Evan Cycle and Waitrose to put a, a an on pavement shared use path. But again, that'd be a relatively short length. And as I've already said, as you head out of town towards the uh, Bill Smith gyratory, there's very little space. So an on-road cycle lane doesn't really work. Next slide, please. There are off-road options and, and, and they have been used and are still used. Um, on this slide, I've just tried to picture them uh, in detail. The red route, which obviously parallels with the uh, green route for some way, the red route is actually the preferred route and the recommended route from the Southeast Chester team's anal analysis of cycle, cycle routes uh, in, their, in their original work and indeed in their project work. Um, and it works reasonably well because you can access the uh, A51 towards the top, the, the right hand of the picture there, effectively getting to point one where a cycle lane along the road does exist. Uh, the canal towpath is, is getting busy and we'll, we'll come to that in a minute uh, and it's well used by walkers as well so it's not a perfect solution but it does work. In terms of the A5115 you either got the option of getting on to point two there which is working way around the back of uh, the bike factory, option three which is coming out and crossing across the stocks lane which is a, which is actually the black route that exists at the moment or wiggling round and find your way back onto the road uh, the A5115 going out in Route 4. Uh, as I said, the, from the analysis done by the South East Chester Group, their preferred option is to take two and then get onto the road. And again, we'll come back to the benefit and the consequence of that option in a minute. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just to emphasise, again, it's it's not to say they're not useful, but there are limits on the, on the, on the uh, canal towpath. The ramp which you have to go up um, to cross uh, the tail end of Westminster Road is not really suitable for anybody other than uh, cyclists pushing their bikes. It has the mobility access is poor for anybody in a trike or a, uh, any other sort of mobility aid. Um, we've already mentioned that uh, down when you have to rejoin the Bill Smith's gyrator, as we call it, you've got to be careful. It's a difficult exit. You've got to pick up the traffic coming along there. And also, if you take the green route uh, coming down towards the, uh, the bottom of the picture there, there's a difficult crossing. So not ideal, but they do work and they are used. So they are an option to consider. Uh, next slide, please. We've looked at cycle lanes and uh, bus lanes along the eastbound route. This is perhaps going in more into the work we're doing with uh, the South East Chester Group, which I'll refer to in a minute. But we have looked at other issues um, and notwithstanding anything we've said about the options for bus lanes or cycle lanes or any form of travel lanes going east, uh, there's also another issue that uh, traffic does back up in, in front of the Hamburger roundabout, particularly uh, in the late afternoon, um, which itself causes delays. And it's something that we need to take into consideration in terms of trying to get ease of flow with or without an additional travel lane. We, we know there's been quite a lot of work done on the light phasing there. There may be still work to be done. And at the end of the day, it is a balance because everybody wants to cross that roundabout, but somebody has to wait at some time. Uh, we have thought about, and we think it's worth discussing, uh, changing the park and ride route out of town. So it goes back down the A51 and A41. And there are other options, not even that route, but the, the, those are things to be discussed, but we've, we've concluded there's no quick fix. And, and as I say, to be honest, this is what's going to go into our into a wider abortion corridor discussions. Uh, as with the next slide, please. Yeah, uh, there's also big questions about th the use of the tarmac uh, along the road. Um, uh, Mike Garris has suggested that the full width of tarmac somewhere in the middle of Great Borton Village is about the same as you'd have on a motorway. So there's a lot of tarmac. Uh, the question is how to use it. Um, our thoughts that we mentioned last week about coming uh, westbound 
and to, to add, adding an extra lane coming westbound from somewhere in the middle of Borton Village would have impact on parking. Uh, there are issues about parking. We feel quite a lot of parking there is not by residents, it's by people parking and walking into town. But nonetheless, there are issues that we believe can be solved, but they're not simple. We've also looked at options for a uh, wider and alternative uh, shared use path, an SUP is a shared use path, which could be added on the south side. The, the current one is on the north side, but again, there are some pinch points. There are issues even today about people parking on those shared use paths, which causes a problem for everybody. Um, and uh, as I said, there may be options to review cycle routes as you go across the Hamburg roundabout. We've talked a minute ago about possible bus routes going back, particularly the park and ride back along the A51 and not the 5115. We've even considered options for, for one way routes, but those are perhaps uh, further than we go at the moment. Uh, so that's what that's where we are. And if we do move to the next slide, then we have our, our recommendations. So it's not as straightforward, it's not as sexy, it's not as exciting, but we believe these are the key points we want to share with you tonight about eastbound traffic. We recommend there should be an advisory cycle lane put along the A51, which we feel together with the 20 mile per hour, mile per hour limit uh, that we've already recommended, it will make it an acceptable route. Uh, not everybody agrees with me what I'm now going to say, but I think the, the, the current situation on the Grosvenor Bridge is about as good as we can get without changing the bridge or changing the traffic flow. Uh, and that's what we're talking about. A lane which is clearly marked, which cyclists can use, and uh, cars are allowed to cross it if they want, but they're, allowed, they're expected to respect any cyclists in there. As I say, my view works acceptably well, but not perfectly on the Grosvenor Bridge. Um, also, having that 20 mile an hour in both directions that we've referred to before will make the uh, exit from the various canal towpath routes and particularly onto the um, uh, Guildsmiths Directory will make that uh, easier to achieve. Uh, I mentioned the, uh, the option for the diverting buses and maybe even some smart options that the, the traffic conditions could send people one way or the other. Uh, but the final point we want to say is we believe we should not reinstate the existing travel lanes as bus lanes along that route. OK, over to Mike now, please, for a, a little bit of discussion about um, origin and destination data. The, the, thanks, thanks, Stephen. Stephen. Uh, uh, I'll be very, I'll be very brief, brief because I think it can get a bit tedious. This. Um, the proposal, Stephen, was just alluding to basically do mean there will be reduced space for motor traffic. And so it's important to understand whether uh, there is adequate capacity for the for the traffic that, that uh, we assume will remain. Uh, we're fortunate that the local authority had commissioned Mott McDonald to produce an origin destination survey and, um, and, and a model to go with it in late 2019. So there was up-to-date data, or at least pre-pandemic uh, data. And uh, thanks to Christy, um, eventually <laughs> this data was made available. Uh, the legalities and, and, and protocols were agreed. And uh, we've been having a look at it. Uh, the data is extremely detailed. If for those of you who can visualise this, it's a 280 zone system of which about 80 zones are outside the city and the 200 odd within the city. And it's uh, it, it, it's quite a handful, if you like, dealing with that amount of data. Um, so we've made a start. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So um, th this is a very brief summary of it, and, I, and, I, and I'll, I'll simply use words to explain what it means for the Borton Corridor. Uh, but it may be of use and interest to, to other people in the task force. So what we did was reduce the 280 zone system to a 30 by 30 zone system, which is easier to kind of get your head around. Eight external zones, basically the corridors or the, the gateways into the city with 22 zones within it. 
And you can see in the bottom right hand corner, but I'm afraid it's a bit small, um, a summary of the uh, the traffics that, that that survey shows uh, comes into the city. For example, of the 90 odd thousand trips in the in the Quack area overall, there's about 10,000 are entering the city from elsewhere. There's about 7,000 in the peak AM peak hour, this is, leaving the city and about eight and a half thousand um, movements within the city. Um, something like 3,000 trips going into the central area, of which 1,800 are actually from outside the city, outside the ring road anyway. So gives you some idea of the kind of volumes of traffic which have to be handled. And, and what we've done is we've taken that data and looked at what that means for the Borton Corridor. So the next slide, please. Um, so the very, very, very briefly, we think uh, our proposals can be supported by the numbers. That is the, the volumes of traffic, uh, the origins and destinations to the local detailed zones as such that they can be handled uh, despite reducing the amount of road space. And fundamentally, I suppose, I look forward to um, discussing this with Kevin Riley at a more detailed level. Thank you. Stephen, are you going to finish yep. up? Just finally, uh, there's been quite a lot, a lot of discussion in our group and at least two occasions where we've talked in this group about communication. Um, we have a communication that we that we had prepared to send out that basically explained what the Travel Lane Group was doing uh, with various uh, details and contact uh, emails. We've drawn up a communication channels map of who should have the communication in what form. However, after a lot of discussion, the team felt at the last meeting we should just hold back. We feel that um, it's more appropriate to work on this communication alongside the local authority um, in order to make sure that whatever whatever reaction we get, especially in the light of the fairly difficult reaction that uh, we had when the lanes first went in, um, that although, as I say, we're <coughs> ready to communicate, we felt it's best to do something alongside the uh, local authority. And I hope that will be a decision that uh, you'll support. Next slide, please. Uh, just I referred to this with some of the points made earlier. I just want to emphasize that we we have, we in a sense as a group has already indicated we started down with the paints on the ground between the, the bars roundabout uh, and the Bill Smith gyratory. We crept eastward as we began to realize that we felt there was a bigger issue to look at a longer route for travel lanes and those that haven't seen it, but the, the westbound travel lane recommendations start in the uh, middle of Borton and, and go all the way to the Bars roundabout. We overlap with our friends from South East Chester and now independent of our work on specific on the travel lanes, we're sharing our knowledge and our expertise and working closely uh, with our friends in South East Chester to develop a, a longer term and more challenging uh, opportunity to do something along the full Borton corridor. Um, finally, next steps. Yep, there's a lot of data behind what Mike said. Um, and just to emphasize what he said, uh, we feel it fully supports our fairly radical recommendations on westbound traffic and suggests that some of the things we're talking about in terms of controlling right turns and things are feasible. We also feel that it gives information that will allow us to look at things like one way systems or changing, you know, encouraging people to go down different routes into and out of the city. And we also feel it will help uh, our friends in other work groups looking at uh, travel and traffic flows in their area. However, we feel that this needs to be developed alongside um, Kevin or the local authority, not in isolation, because it's quite complicated and we believe they should be doing that with us. We also feel that uh, certainly in the next two or three weeks, we'd like to meet with, as we said in that in the note here, with senior councillors and senior officers. Uh, that might now be with Kevin 
Um, but I do think in quite generally there's some political issues here, especially around the 20 mile an hour recommendations we made and some of the other issues. But whatever the process is, I think we are in a sense at the end of our initial phase of work. We have got, we've got, um, sorry about this. We have got, we have got, um, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, we've got all the information we need uh, what we need to make sure is that shared clearly and that we move forward to what might be something that's implemented. So thanks for listening and any questions, happily answer them. OK, any, any questions for Stephen? Thanks for the presentation, Stephen. Once again, thanks to the team as well. Apologies for the phones ringing, sorry about that. Okay. Nope, you seem to have satisfied all their curiosity, Stephen. Good, well, hopefully, and anybody wants any more information by email, I'll happily send it to them, thank you. OK, thank you for that. So we move on to your neighbouring partner, South East Chester. So, John. OK, thank you, Garfield. Um, great presentation, Stephen, and um, very pleased to see some of the inputs on the eastbound uh, carriageway. OK, um, just wanted to, first of all, say that um, uh, David Beer has left us to a more challenging role elsewhere, so we're without his sort of uh, in-depth um, public transport knowledge, but we have got a, a committed team. Um, he left us with a few key messages, which I'll just mention now briefly. One is we need to get this uh, public transport team working across the STTF. We do need to have some feedback on the bus service review group uh, within CWAC, and we need to get a plan for en enhanced partnerships with operators and uh, I think David was saying he discovered that we, we needed to actually provide the national bus strategy needs on our service improvement request by the end of October. So that there's a few key tasks there that are important. Moving on to the work that um, Stephen referred to that we're working together on, um, we have developed a, a brief for Planet. Um, the starting date for the work with Planet will actually be mainly driven by the work that Stephen and Mike are doing and we've agreed that we would wait until they'd reached the point where we would make a start but we've actually put in a request for approval of a sum of money which will provide for a professional input and visualization of the southeast Chester cycling plans and I remind you those are the cycling plans for Great Borton, Huntington, Waverton, Littleton and Crystleton. Uh, they'll actually produce uh, regeneration options for Borton and uh, what they will need before they start that is some clarity on what we're proposing for the uh, for the travel lanes. Um, I'm going to say something now about Crystalton because Crystalton, the work in Crystalton started well before the STTF. Uh, what's interesting about it though is that there's quite a few read across um, messages for the work that we are proposing to do on this slide. Okay, so I I'm just going to put up one more slide, please, Garfield. Um, this is a slide that um, Planet had produced. Doesn't sort of reproduce too well because we had a technology problem between us, me and Garfield, but I think it's good enough. This is Preston, by the way. This is on the left hand side is how it was before. And on the right hand side is how it is afterwards. OK, it's just demonstrating simplistically that on the uh, Borton Corridor, we could call it the Borden Garden route, but I believe that there'll be some confusion if it's called that. Um, we can actually um, present something to the community which is um, complete in that provides uh, a beneficial outcome for businesses, provides a beneficial outcome for pedestrians, and provides the sort of space that people will want to use. We've had quite a few comments actually in South East Chester that just putting a cycle lane in and painting it green or whatever won't actually uh, get us the traction we need and the number of cyclists we'd like to use the route. We actually need to make this a, a totally different feel, okay? So I'm going to say something about feel next when I talk about Crystalton because you will see um, what that means for Crystalton and it, it does read across directly into the work that we're suggesting goes, goes in place along the Borton Corridor. So in Crystalton, the, uh, in May 2020, we actually proposed um, some outline plans for the centre of Crystalton. We had a meeting with uh, Sean Trainer at the time. 
We agreed we would move on to produce some detailed plans. They were produced in August. In September, those plans were submitted for highways review and safety audit, conservation and landscaping. We got as far as actually talking to a contractor from an implementation point of view, and we've got some good feedback there. And we've just completed a consultation in the village and um, we put out a thousand uh, booklets, 32 page booklets, a detailed explanation of what we were doing and why we were doing it. And we got an 83% approval, which is uh, a good result. Uh, the important thing, though, about that is it takes a year. OK. Um, the proposals were designed to encourage Christleton residents and high school parents to cycle and walk. There are still 300 uh, parents a day who bring their children into the middle of the village and drop their children off. And if you say that's 300 in, 300 out, and then in the afternoon, 300 in and 300 out, you're talking about a very large number of movements. In addition to that, we've actually got um, uh, a large cut through traffic between the A41 and the A51. You might imagine that Crystalton, for people who live in it, 100 or 200 houses in the centre might be seen as a village. It's actually seen as a route through for uh, commuters. And half of the traffic that goes through Crystalton is cut through traffic, literally half of it. Um, one of the main reasons is queuing at the St. Camp Hamburger Junction. And as a result, in the middle of the village, we end up with, in a typical four day period, 83 pavement mountings. These are cars and large vehicles going up onto pavements, which are children are on. We've got cyclists in the road. We've got waves of cyclists. I talked about that uh, last week and we get 18 complete gridlocks. Uh, and right in the middle of the village, we've got PM 2.5 particle uh, concentrations, which are above the World Health Organization uh, limit. So these proposals, um, which if we just take it to the next slide, please. Uh, this briefly just shows you Christleton. Um, Normally, I'd be able to sort of um, draw on it with my mouse, but I don't think I can do that, can I, Garfield? But um, yeah, fortunately not, no. You'll see it surrounded by the A51 in the north, the A51 in the south. Um, the A51 is heavily polluted with uh, nitrogen dioxide. Levels um, uh, are higher than 91% of the concentrations in the Chester Air Quality Management Area, which is peculiar. In other words, it's generally worse than the Chester Air Quality Management Area, but it isn't an air quality management area. The A41, uh, the levels along the A41 are greater than 77% of the readings in the middle of Chester. And along both those roads, and particularly at the Hamburger Roundabout, there are very high concentrations of PM 2.4, 2.5. And in the centre of the village of Crystalton, there are high levels of uh, uh, PM 2.5. And, and, and they, these are the drivers behind uh, these changes. So the next slide, this just shows you um, an example of one of the designs at the end of Plough Lane, just outside the high school. Um, the route uh, for cars uh, is from the top of the slide to the bottom of the slide. Uh, the giveaways uh, are on the west and the east side. It's a 20 mile an hour limit. Cars come across that junction at uh, 40 miles an hour. Average speed on Roundbridge Road is 29 miles an hour. And the proposal that uh, Planet have produced is for ramps from each of the road up onto this junction be a no priority junction. It will create uncertainty for drivers. Drivers will slow down. And uh, to the bottom of the drawing, you'll see the start of Roundbridge Road. And at the moment, that's a key route to school. It's a park and, try, it's park and stride. Uh, route to school. Um, some parents do actually drop their children off on the periphery of the village and they do walk down there. But in the mornings and in the afternoons there are waves of cyclists, waves of uh, pedestrians and cars and no footpath and therefore this design provides for a, a footpath. Next slide. This is a picture of what it would look like. Um, this is a sort of a, a measure of the, the design. So sort of moving on to the next slide, this is the centre of the village. Difficult to see, I think, but basically the centre of the village will again be a paved area. There will be ramps up onto the paved area. We're, we're confident from all of the feedback we've had of this sort of installation elsewhere that this will have a massive impact on drivers. Drivers will come up the ramp onto a paved area 
they will feel as if they're on a pavement. They will feel as if they should be driving slowly. They will know they shouldn't be there unless they need to be there. It will reduce the cut through traffic. It will also make parents more comfortable about vehicle speeds in the village. There'll be less congestion. There'll be no pavement mounting. There'll be lower pollution and more people will cycle and more people will walk. And um, basically that's that's the last slide. So um, my my next um, task is to engage with CWAC on these designs and um, pleased to see that Andrew Blackburn's in the audience because uh, I'm starting with Andrew Blackburn as Sean Trainer, who was working with me throughout this process in Christleton told me about Andrew Blackburn coming and he said one of the first persons you should meet is Andrew. So I'm looking forward to meeting you this week, Andrew. So any questions? Uh, Alex, yes. Yeah. Um, have you been able to consult Christleton High School on these plans and the students within the school? Yeah, we've we've actually uh, worked with the chair of the governors and the, the headmaster. Um, I'll be briefing the headmaster this week. It's one of the questions I'm going to ask him. Um, uh, one of the members of uh, this group uh, last month actually uh, talked to me after the meeting and we agreed that there'd be some sort of engagement process. So I've got to talk to Darren Jones about that. Thank you. OK, thanks, Alex. Any more questions for John? Another very detailed presentation, John. Thank you. Nope. OK, well, as usual, all these um, slides are available if you need the details afterwards or you can get in touch with John, who will be um, very happy, I know, to send you more details on that. So thanks again. So moving to the um, the next pilot group, which is the, the city centre one. Um, now, Andy um, Farrell is normally the, um, the lead on this. Um, he's asked me to send you a message saying he's um, on holiday, he's he's um, not in a Greek island, which he would really prefer to be at the moment. He's um, on the north coast of Anglesey, so um, he um, uh, probably getting the same kind of weather we're getting at the moment. So I hope he's relaxing and we'll see him at the next meeting. But he's done a great deal of work with his team, and I know we have members of the team on the call tonight. Um, He's just asked me to present these couple of slides. I don't really have any in-depth information on these, but I'm very happy to try and <clears throat> answer any as best I can. As you know, he took his particular pilot group and further subdivided it into those five, uh, six groups that you can see at the top. And, it, oops, and each of those has, um, has been working really quite in detail. And I've, I've seen a, the output from some of these groups and it, it's, it's amazing. It really is a very high quality indeed. Um, and as you can see at the bottom there, Andy's approach is slightly different from the other pilot groups. What he's doing here is making what's called a toolkit. He's looking at the, what you need in order to be able to establish certain protocols within the city um, by looking at other examples around the world and looking at the basic components you need when designing something that needs to be put in place. So without a particular focus of a point in mind. And then the idea is that when that point comes up to be looked at, you can work through the toolkit and apply those particular steps of logic to the situation you have in front of you. And I think that's a really neat way of tackling the problem that was set him. So he's worked on this with his teams on each of those six um, areas. And I think when he gets come back from holiday nice and refreshed, he'll be working on those and producing a final report. So I expect that he will probably be the, the first of our pilot groups to submit their findings. Um, so you can see for each of the groups there, and I'm not going to read through these, you, you can do that yourself, but you can see that each of the groups there has, has actually um, indicated the progress they're making at the moment. Um, and particularly like the city centre living, subgroup and it said that it's been very active and uh, developed some initial thinking revision for the city centre and how smart mobility can help deliver this. I think that's a really fascinating area and we've all seen the, the way in which um, the, the ginger scooters have taken off and various other aspects of people moving around the town uh, are getting how can I put it, you know, up to date and modern. And I think this will really make a difference. Plus the new housing, which is going up in the city centre as well. So I think that's a particular area of um, delight, really. 
And the next steps for his group are the paper that I was mentioning a few earlier, a few moments ago, and a framework for how you apply this particular toolkit to Chester with a focus on the city centre and a, pa a paper outlining the vision for the city centre living. Um, and then both of these are what's called thought leadership papers, which will go to um, the one city plan um, and then put forward to the council in full. So um, that's that I think is a great piece of work. I don't know if there's anybody else on the call tonight would like to kind of highlight any of the areas. If we maybe move back to that slide, is anybody here? I've got um, Tammy or Tandy or anybody else who'd like to comment at all. Ah, Nicola. Yeah, I um I wasn't able to make the last group meeting, but in previous discussions, the bit that I've been focusing on is the, um, you know, looking at smart apps and and what's been done elsewhere in the world and in in terms of technology, and it was just a point really because on Friday I had a meeting with Transport for the North, um, who were doing a consultation with destinations across the north about how transport can work better for the visitor economy. And it just made me think that, you know, there's lots of the places around the country are also looking at, you know, multimodal um, smart apps to try and encourage, you know, people to move from place to place by sustainable travel. And, you know, how we work together and look for solutions that are joined across multiple destinations, because, you know, we really don't want to like create an app in Chester where we're encouraging people to, you know, come by train and then showing them how they can move around the place and um, if you know there's something that we can look at on a broader scale um so it's just a it's an additional thought really from from that from that meeting that i had about basically just not you know duplicating across the country and where lots of people will be looking for sort of smart solutions and seeing if we can work together on technology yeah absolutely yeah, absolutely that's music to my ears. The um, you'll hear a little bit more from me in the final project about the Ellesmere Port area, but people will know that I'm very keen on the idea of people being able to get on a train, say in Ellesmere Port, go to Delamere, do some walking and cycling around, get on a bus, jump there, move back onto a train in Chester, go back out there using a single app where they can just uh, they can do cross modal transport ticketing. Yeah. And it's just not just within Cheshire West, but, you know, if you arrive in Manchester Airport that, you know, you use one app that gets you, tells you how to get from there to Chester and, and so on. So um, so I just think it's just, I haven't had a chance to speak to Andy about this, but just keep making sure that we're kind of thinking about the scope and the interconnection with other places. Yeah. Yeah. And it also comes into play with the, the Rural Mobility Fund, which I'll be talking about in a moment as well, on a, a slightly lesser scale, but the same kind of principle. Thanks, Nicola. Anybody else from Andy's team want to give a quick update? Roy. Thanks, Chair. Uh, it's just to say in terms of the Smart Mobility Hubs, which is the group that uh, I'm involved with. Yep. The work isn't looking at a one size fits all. It is looking at literally anything from you might put a, some cycle stands by a bus stop, by a supermarket right the way through to a multimodal interchange say at chester station so it's looking at what's sensible where and how you might link those into the corridor work that's being done which we've heard of earlier so that you get a, a a true multimodal interchange but what's relevant to the local area yeah absolutely Yes, thank you for that, Roy. I mean, one thing that is emerging from these pilots is this commonality of need, isn't it, across the different areas? Yeah, and I think that's really been a strong point. And if we can we can harness that and and channel them together to make a single kind of product across the the borough, that would be that would be really good. Thank you, Roy. Anybody else? Okay, that's great. So um, I mentioned that one. So I think we're up to. What's my favourite set of slides because of the pink and blue optimism that these slides always seem to yield? So I think Sue is going to talk to these tonight, Sue. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Garfield. So I'm Sue Stanley from the Love Your Upton team, which is how we've named the Upton pilot. If I could have the next slide, please. So we're giving you a progress across a number of fronts tonight. Um, I'll give you more detail on each of the first uh, four. 
Um, the, the last three are more for information. So I will talk about the bid that we've submitted to the Climate Emergency Fund, um, which we're now awaiting feedback on. We'll talk about cycling mapping, which has kicked off for Upton. There's a meeting we had with Stagecoach. So we met with their regional MD um, and commercial director, and we specifically asked them a lot of questions about Upton, but we thought there could be a lot of interest in there for other people who were looking at buses. And living streets for walking. So we're looking at um, moving ahead on that front as well. So I'll talk about each of those. To let you know, on the highways front, the traffic management front, so Doug Jenkins, who was a part of our team, has now stepped down from the pilot team, but his traffic management expertise is still available to the pilot group. So we look forward to continuing to work with Doug um, in a new way in the future. He'll be carrying on with Community Speedwatch, 20s Plenty and parking issues around Upton. So I think he's got a lot on his plate. Um, on the active travel lane um, for Upton um, along the A5116, um, we've agreed not to move forward on working on that at the moment. We agreed this with Councillor Karen Shaw. Um, and until we've met with um, the highways group to understand the rationale for the actual Upton um, travel lane they are along the A516. So we're, we are pausing that work ourselves at the moment. And then um, the last point to let you know that we've begun to work um, with the Parish Council. We made a first presentation to the Upton Assembly um, this month, the annual parish meeting, which was well received. So if I move on to the next slide, please, Garfield. So this is um, our bid for feasibility funding. So we thought this was a real opportunity to apply for something that would help us move forward across the whole of Upton and covering a number of fronts on which we wish to work to encourage active travel. We've called it the Upton Triangle because of the, the if you notice, the A5116 um, and the A41 um, form a sort of triangle um, with the, the southern boundary of Upton Newton. Um, there's a bit of Upton on either side of those triangle areas and we're going to be looking at the whole area. But I think the triangle is particularly important because of the potential cut throughs, which we believe happen quite a bit between the A5116 and the A41. So people viewing Upton as a through route in the same way that was just talked about for Christleton. So we're looking at in this project to identify relatively low cost and straightforward traffic management and engineering measures that would actually significantly respond to the climate emergency and can be implemented fairly quickly, but also simultaneously meet the wishes of the Upton community. And in particular, so that people will feel that it's safe um, to get out on your bike and to walk around Upton. And at the moment, we know that lots and lots of people believe it's not safe because of the amount, the volume and speed of traffic. So we want to do in parallel those two aspects within Upton in order to come up with targeted measures that can be implemented quite quickly. So we're looking for feasibility funding to get this costed business case for it and measuring measurable carbon savings. And we hope that by doing this, we could come up with a blueprint for a process that could be applied to other neighbourhoods. So we're looking at being pioneers really in this, this sort of area. Uh, next slide, please. Just to remind ourselves of the Climate Emergency Response Plan for Cheshire West, um, the work done by Anthesis for, for Cheshire West said that transport currently contributes 90, 19% of carbon emissions, that's excluding agriculture, forestry, land use and so on, but it's a high proportion. And the Climate Emergency Response Plan requires it by 2025, which let's, you know, is only four to five years away, four and a half years away now, a 25% reduction in car travel across Cheshire West, and actually an increase to um, use of public transport to 18% from less than 10%. And in, additionally, by 2024, a 25% increase in weekly cycling from a very quite a low baseline, less than 9% at the moment, and also a 25% increase in weekly walking. And those are quite challenging targets, but they're ones that we would hope that we might be able to make some progress on within Upton. Um, and they would be our ambition to actually do that by 2025. Next slide, please. 
So I've already mentioned that we believe that success is about having both effective community engagement and targeted technical change. Um, we're talking about going to, about it in a different way from Christleton, but there are lots of parallels, I think, with what John Beckett was talking about in, in Christleton. So we believe this, uh, what's been happening around the country in trying to diminish traffic flows, make neighbourhoods nicer for people to walk and to cycle, easier for them to do that, may have been done without actually having effective community engagement at the same time as actual targeted technical change, too often being top down. So what we're looking at is on the ground local conversations, and we want this to be done in parallel and not by producing something that's a recommendation and then getting a survey feedback. We want to actually talk to people um, around shops and schools um, about what it is that's preventing active travel at the moment, as well as a technical measurement of what's going wrong. So the, the picture at the bottom, 20 is plenty, you would potentially extending 20 mile per hour speed limits. Um, there's an example of children and parents trying to cross um, a busy interchange in the middle of Upton coming home from school. So we believe there are these sort of relatively straightforward interventions, if they're properly targeted, if people they're what people want, will actually make a difference in Upton. And as well as this um, project that we are proposing for funding, we will have a number of ongoing initiatives around car speed, reducing car speed, increasing walking and cycling around Upton to start to raise people's awareness about that um, in parallel with all the other work. And that will be about um, some of the next um, slides, which I'll be telling you about. If we can move to the next one, please. So number two, cycling mapping has now started around Upton, following the same process that's been carried out in the South East Chester Parish's work, um, and which is currently also being carried out in Hull. The outcome to be a map identifying key destinations and desire lines for people to cycle, recommendations for changes and improvements to encourage cycling, which I think a number of people here are already aware of that sort of work. So it's about being able to say, these are the sorts of things we really would help to, to allow people to cycle to key destinations around Upton. We're also checking that out with regard to walking at the same time, where there's the opportunity to do that. And to say we're going beyond Upton, where we think um, that it's important for Upton residents to be able to travel and other people to travel into Upton, um, so that the whole of this side of Chester ultimately will have been mapped by these interlocking projects. Um, and we're expecting to complete our work um, in three or four months and feeding in to potential future um, bids for improvement um, in cycling networks. Next slide, please. The next one is the meeting we have with Stagecoach, which I mentioned at the beginning. It was a very useful meeting that we had, as I say, with top level people from Stagecoach. Um, and we got very information, very interesting information from them about how they see things at the moment that we thought was worth sharing with everyone. So they're not expecting um, that they will get back to the level of people on, on buses they had pre pandemic. Um, mainly because of the, the trend for a decrease in use of buses. So uh, it will be, if anything, accelerated by what's happened in the last year by increases in working from home, decline of the high street, rise of internet shopping. So, but they're saying that full recovery of bus passenger numbers is possible if only one to two percent of car users used the bus. And they want to say yes to route changes, structure, different structures of pricing, um, they're constrained at the moment because of government uh, funding up till June, but after that they are very constrained on their cost uh, reinvestment profit model they have to operate under. And Chester presents a very marginal business to a bu bus operator, so they're really not making huge amounts of money out of Chester. But they're very excited by the national bus strategy, which is the first thing that we've seen coming along nationally. Um, look forward to working, they hope, with the council on that on improvements to bus routes, um, ticketing, whatever needs to be done in Chester, uh, um, and, and having joint bids potentially for some of this three billion that the government's making available. Next slide, please. So getting back to Upton, people from Upton had told us that there are huge gaps in Upton services, but they're in the reduplication of some services. 
Lack of evening services is a key problem for people nowadays. Um, timetables at the moment haven't recommenced on pre-pandemic timings. Costing is relatively expensive, so either £4 or £4.40 to travel to Chester, depending on which bus you take and if you haven't got a free bus pass. Why not having single ticketing? That's been brought up elsewhere. Low emission buses, so people are very concerned about air quality, which of course comes into our, our previous discussion about um, moving to active travel, but also low emission buses um, and what stage coaches plans might be in that area. But, and then how do they evaluate the need for a service and what inputs would they actually be interested in from a local community? Next slide, please. Oh dear, is it jammed? It's jammed again, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Well, I hope you will. Oh, you've got there it. You there you got it. So just a few highlights. I mean, any any questions or follow up afterwards, please, if there are any specific things that are not mentioned, because I can't go through everything tonight. But they say there is very limited budget for them to do local consultations. So they rarely actually do that. Um, and particularly they don't do much at the moment beyond people who are using the buses and talking to them. But they have done a national survey um, um, and, you know, in the last year and why do car users not choose the bus? And interestingly, they found that there were 20 percent who said you'll never, ever get me out of my car. Um, you know, so you've got this tail end of 20 percent who are never going to get a bus. Um, I think you've potentially got another 20% at the top end who probably don't need much encouragement. But actually, it's the people in the middle that, um, that we, we need a lot of help with if getting them um, out of their cars, potentially into a bus or onto a bike or walking. Um, they can model um, things that um, tra um, active travel lanes for bus usage improvements would be done out of non-pandemic conditions. So they could look, look at cost benefits of that. Um, and they talked about the benefits of them, obviously, for their buses, in, mainly in terms of stopping and starting and pulling out, actually, interestingly. Um, but the congestion around Chester in, in general is more often on single carriageway roads and not the dual carriageway. From their national work, they found out that people, apart from people on a very low income, are not that price sensitive. But what they want is really to know how long their journey time is going to take, which is quite clearly what everyone's after. So punctuality, reliability, frequency. And that often is about why people jump into the car, because they cannot rely on the, the bus journey time. But they do say these things need low congestion. Next slide, please. So in terms of our next steps with them, we would like to have some dialogue with um, Cheshire West um, on uh, buses, which we haven't start, been able to start doing yet. But the ambitions for the park and ride um, at our end of Chester and actually what was the rationale is the rationale for the um, active travel lane on, on the A5116. We want to continue positive dialogue with Stagecoach. They were very keen to carry on talking to us. Any proposals we've got um, after June, you know, for the sorts of things that could be trialled by them, they are willing to look at. They would like to um, carry on co co um, consulting with communities if com communities want to do that. Um, and of course, input into, I've already referred to this, the bids for the national bus strategy money. There, and we will carry on looking at that. Uh, Sorry, go on. Carry on. Sorry, it went the wrong way there. Uh, carry on. Next slide, please. Next, next. Yeah, we've somehow gone backwards. <laughs> we've finished that one. Right. So I'll now move on to walking, which we've only just started um, looking at what we want to do on walking. Um, and we're very interested in joining Living Streets as a local group. So this is a national um, charitable organisation. They get a lot of government funding. Um, but their vision is to have a, na a nation where walking is the natural cho choice for local everyday journeys. Um, and their mission is to achieve a better walking environment and inspire people to walk more. Now, to do this, if we become a local group, which I think we're quite likely to, and we would, by the way, be the first local group in Chester. Um, and um, there is a group on the Wirral, but that's the nearest one at the moment. They, it gives us access to things like their national ca campaigns and their literature and a uh, lot of information and, they, and resources that they can provide us with. Um, and in particular, 
packs for schools. So um, I'm, we're not sure whether Cheshire West have used this at all in, in schools around Cheshire, but uh, Chester, sorry. Um, but we weren't aware of it if, if they have done. Um, as I say, there isn't a local group. Um, and potentially anyone in the Chester area could join our local group if they wanted to. Um, we are likely to focus on schools in the first instance because we're seeing that as an, a, an important area in Upton. It was mentioned the three, 300 car journeys to Christleton High School every day. I think we're, we're probably in the same sort of league with Upton High School as well. And in addition, we have um, all our primary schools, we have our... Um, our special educational needs school as well with a lot of transport moving around Upton for for the schools at the moment so that's the sort of idea we've got and where we are starting to to work on the walking front next slide please I've almost finished you'll be pleased to hear so um, we've now structured our team so at the top you can see community feedback and engagement um, um, communication sorry feedback and engagement so with the community, with obviously this team and Cheshire West, and also with the parish council. So those are we're seeing as our major communication um, channels and two way channels of communication and engagement. Um, work streams we've divided into our one on highways and traffic management, public transport, cycling and walking, keeping it very simple. But those we see as the main areas we have to influence with regard to active travel. Um, we've got a lead person and a second person for each of those areas. Um, owing to Doug um, moving aside and, and still there as a consultant to us, we are looking for someone to head up our work on traffic management at highways. Um, so if anyone knows of anyone with any knowledge expertise in that area, particularly if they know about Upton or an Upton resident, we'll be very pleased to hear from them. Next slide, please. And then um, finally, we the 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 dimension that goes across that slide so the gaps in the middle were left there for a purpose um, on each of our projects um, we have key interfaces with um, some very important um, organizations around Upton so we already have a link with the Countess of Chester the hospital um, and their plans for future travel um, with the zoo with Kathy um, with schools um, and we are developing our links with schools Local businesses, which um, we're about to start, we haven't started working with our businesses as yet. Um, and of course, um, Doug, uh, as traffic management, uh, key interface on that front. And that is pretty much it for now. So thank you very much. We'll move to the next slide. And if there are any questions, I'm very sorry about the phone. I turn my mobile off and I've got the landline. <laughs> so thank you, Sue. Questions for Sue. Very good presentation. Thank you. <laughs> a few applause coming up there. That's that's nice to see. So oh. there's a few things in there. Did you did you know that this was walking month? Yes, we did. We hadn't quite got started as a local um, walking group or we were, I'm sure we would have been in on that. We have tried to publicise this on our community Facebook page. Yes. Yeah. So I just thought that, that was good. I, I don't know who invents these, um, you know, things it's walking month or it's this month or it's that month but anyway it's walking month um i found it very interesting to to hear about the the costing models that stagecoach are operating under and that really chester is not a great input to that um and that you know how do we break out of that mold you know um of having modern clean efficient alternatively fueled buses um but people won't pay the amount of fare that's needed to to travel into the city it's a it's a it's a real conundrum isn't it i think it is and that they were t we were contrasting upton with say blaken and of course we've got a different demographic structure a different you know number of features which make different areas more attractive to them in, in running frequent buses and so on um but if we we believe if we can get more people in upton rather than it being a declining um, trend because there are no evening buses it becomes circular people are actually demanding this and we can trial a few things in upton that we might get people moving more in that direction Yes, definitely. OK, a couple of questions come in. John, John Beckett. Uh, Sue, that was that was fantastic. I enjoyed that. OK, uh, just a couple of points. Um, just on the numbers, um, you, you did something that we did at the beginning as well. We started looking at the targets for uh, the um, 
climate emergency. And uh, one of the targets that I have most difficulty with is the plus 25 percent increase in cycling. The, the way I see it at the moment, and I'd be interested in comments from others, if you just take a sort of a, a piece of road and allocate a bit of road space and say that's a, a cycle lane, you might get a 25 or 30 percent increase in cycling. If, on the other hand, you actually change the atmosphere of the road completely, mm -hmm. uh, change the way people see the destination, all the evidence indicates that the increase can be 200 or 300 percent. OK, so I'll, I'll just just suggest you raise your eyes a little. The other thing is there's a big issue around low traffic neighborhoods at the moment, which a lot of people will have come across. And there's a lot of expertise around. Um, Planet have some expertise in that. We're hoping that when they do their work on Borton, they're going to suggest some low traffic neighborhoods. And finally, Living Streets, I totally support engaging with them. We've used them and we found them very good, actually. Mm. So, uh, but, but thanks for all of that. Oh, that's, that's good. It. it would be very good to collaborate with you, John, on some of that. And um, particularly, as you say, the work with Planet, uh, because we haven't started looking at good examples of low traffic neighbourhoods, because, of course, the press only talk about the ones that haven't worked. So a way into knowing about that would be very helpful. Um, living streets are great because they have 40 or more local groups around the country and they've already identified one near Leeds, a place called Moortown, which they think is a bit similar to Upton. So to start to, I think someone's already said, not reinvent the wheel, but where we can look at where things have worked, um, I think that'll be very helpful. OK, and thanks. Stephen, Stephen Hughes. Hi. Yes. So, thank you very much. That was that was really uh, really insightful. And um, yeah, I was going to mention a, a couple of things that you did then about about living streets and so on. But it seems like you've you've got it covered. Could you um, could you go into a little bit more detail about the the travel lane? And you mentioned that you're waiting to hear the rationale from the uh, from the from from Quack. But yeah, why exactly is that holding holding up the progress there? And and yeah, what are the next steps? I guess. Yes. Well, we haven't seen any data yet um, about what benefit is expected from it on that particular route. We know that the park and ride usage um, from the chess at our end, if you like, is quite low or pre pandemic was quite low and obviously is even lower now. Um, and it's it's um, reduced the the car traffic flow to, to one lane. There are problems with cutting across it could potentially have increased um, car usership, um, so sort of transport people cutting through Upton. So mm -hmm. we, we'd like to really know what are the benefits, are the numbers on this, is the data behind this, what was the expectation before we start going off in, in the wrong direction. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we, there are a number of fronts on which we'd love to have some further discussions um, on that one. But that one specifically, because of course our pilot was looking at this uh, as a first priority, we didn't feel well equipped to do that at the moment. So that's why mm -hmm. we're causing that. OK, OK. OK, thanks, Stephen. Any other questions for Sue? OK, thanks, Sue. Thanks very much. You're welcome. So finally, um, my own group, although I am about to hopefully appoint a chair to look after this particular group, um, is the Ellesmereport Hellsbyn Frodsham area and we've been busy in this intervening period but just a quick recap of the geographical area that this covers um, this is a particular area of interest to me uh, for eight years I was based at Thornton Science Park at the University of Chester as Dean so um, I worked with companies around this area and ran in the hills and cycled in these hills relentlessly over that those periods and I came to love it very much and respect if you like the challenge and the the potential of this area and and colleagues will probably know that this particular industrial area to the north of the the M56 here is um moving very rapidly towards renewable energy uh, status of a very high nature and we also have high net based over here as well which has just um, been awarded over £70 million pounds, um, in developing hydrogen uh, transfer techniques through the pipe network there. So there's a huge amount going on in this area. We also have a, a, a very large area in Ellesmere Port of potential um, employment um, prospects. Plus we have a, a rural area which is the complete opposite end of things 
which is um, beautiful, very beautiful indeed, but very, very remote. You know, there's very few bus services run through here. Uh, a lot of uh, sparse population pockets uh, where transport is a challenge. But we have two lines. We have two railway lines running through here. You can see one at the bottom, which is the um, the route to Manchester through Delamere Forest and um, Maltringham. So that's going through um, Delamere Station and Molesworth there. And at the top, um, we have the, the line coming down from um, Eltermere Port into Helsby, which um, all being well, if everything goes well, will be um, run by Mersey Rail as a, a, a battery service to extend their line through to Helsby. Uh, we also have the main line coming from uh, Chester itself through to Manchester and Chester up to Liverpool. And these all fall under the area that I uh, look after as chair of the Community Rail Partnership. And it's that particular area, together with some of the initiatives which um, the council are running at the moment, which is driving our group forward at the moment. So I mentioned last time the Rural Mobility Fund uh, for what's called Demand Responsive Transport. So if I just go back to that particular map, you can see the the way in which it would be very useful if people who are living in these small pockets um, of rural community could have a bus which actually just pick them up more or less at their doorstep at a known time and take them to where they want to go. That's the nature of demand responsive transport. And the council have been awarded a million pounds to look at a feasibility study for this particular type of transport. So um, I'm working with um, Jared Rhodes on this particular project and my colleagues in the uh, Pilot 4 group and in the Community Rail Network are coming together to produce a survey, a questionnaire and survey to find out how people travel in these areas and what they'd really like to see. Now this has gained a little bit of strength if I just kind of move through um, to this slide here. This is the area in which the demand responsive transport would operate and I believe there's actually a discussion going on about this little kink in Alvanley which I think is due to the parish boundaries, I'm not quite sure, but anyway Jared's looking at that at the moment to see if we can perhaps smooth this out a little bit. But we're, So if we've got people wanting to get to railway stations, if we've got people wanting to get to Cheshire Oaks, but they can't because they're in a place that doesn't have a bus service, the natural thing they do is they jump in the car. And um, and that's what we want to try and avoid. We want to try and get people more and more to share a transport link between these places so that they can uh, travel between here much more easily and at a known time and hopefully, as I say, on the doorstep. So demand responsive transport says it all really in its name. This isn't a new scheme. There are quite a number of sites around the UK have already got uh, such a service in operation. There's Hull, uh, Teesside and um, Milton Keynes. And then there are quite a lot in North America as well, as I know of, are also operating on a very similar basis. And as usual with these kind of things, it takes a little time to take off. Then people get the message and then they move forward from there. But we're not just looking at the daytime users who you might think, you know, they would want to get down to do the shopping or something like that. What I'm particularly keen to look at is the extremes of the day. The very early morning transport when you can't get a bus normally or you can't get a train until you know, whatever time on a Sunday and also at the very end of the day where you've got the people um, who've been out to clubs or to the cinemas, the Cheshire Oaks or wherever and they're looking for some transport to get them home. So those particular groups I think are very interesting and give us a very unique challenge which also spreads into the, the rail side as well. As you know we are hopefully emerging from this this lockdown and we're going to hopefully be wanting to travel around and this is the phrase that um, the community rail network in the UK are going to be using to hopefully entice people back out onto trains. So the community rail network and there are 80 local lines around the UK which fall under this particular network will be out and about and 
promoting this particular um, banner and trying to get people out there. So if you link those two things together, if you put those two things together, the, there is a very powerful way in which we can try to find um, information about what people do in these communities and how they would like to use it better. How, what do they see that their stations need improving? Would they like EV charging in the stations? Would they like cycle racks in the stations? What, what would they like to see there? How would they like to get there? What's their preferred transport? Would they, how would they respond to demand responsive transport and so on? There are different communities who would be interested in applying these. I've mentioned if you what I, what I call the night people, the people who travel really late at night to clubs and things like that. There are school children and there are people who want to go to the um, Cheshire Oaks or hospitals and things like that. So many different communities. So we're going to be targeting those with a questionnaire designed to try and get the best out of these two, if you like, unique areas. Uh, we've had the first meeting, um, which was on the 1st of May, I think it was, um, where we we worked on the, the first version of the survey and we got a tremendous amount of feedback and needless to say, there's now going to be a second version of the survey, which will be uh, somewhat different. Um, but this, I find, is, is a really interesting and um, I suppose quite challenging area for us to get into. So that's um, what our particular group have been up to at the moment. Um, and as I said, the, the, we'll be sharing the cost between the Community Rail Network and the Council on producing this leaflet, which will go right across this particular area and um, get their feedback on what they'd like to see. Um, so that's what Pilot 4 has been up to. Any, any questions on what I've just been talking about? Nothing stunned you all into silence. OK, great. So I'll report more on that next time. So that's the end of that. So let me just quick that off. And um, OK, so we're back to the agenda now and we're down to item nine. And this is where um, we can take any questions which you've got for the council or any other aspect of the, the task force and we will try and come back to you with an answer if um, if we we can find one. Cathy. Hello. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Cathy Harrington and I'm a member of the South East Chester pilot group. Um, my question this evening is about communication. Um, I, I'm a member of the pilot group, but I also have a particular interest in how the Sustainable Transport Task Force communicates with the public and how we do that as a whole and I think it's absolutely vital that we do that in a way which is um, engaging, uh, which is positive and which addresses people's concerns but also which moves people along so that they understand that the council's agenda of um, combating climate change is something that must be addressed and that um, hopefully they will join in with addressing. So this evening, what I'd like to raise is about these meetings, these monthly meetings, and how we're communicating those to the public. Because at the moment, um, as far as I'm aware, and I'd really like to see if we can get an answer from the council, maybe if not at this meeting, maybe in a, a few days or something, um, they're pu publicised on the council's webpage to do with active transport. And as I understand it, um, it's only the most recent meeting that's on there. So my request would be for a dedicated webpage with a lot more explanation about the Sustainable Transport Task Force. I would be happy to work with them on putting that together and also with other experts in PR and marketing. And, um, I feel that at the moment it's quite difficult for the public to find the information. I understand also that there's a YouTube travel, uh, channel with all the meetings on, but I don't know that everybody knows that. So that's what I would like to raise this evening. OK, thank you very much, Cathy. And I know we've talked about this um, a number of times. So um, I don't know if there's anybody from the Council, Christie, or anybody would like to respond. So shall we uh, just table it and... Uh, get a response in time. 
I'd be happy if it was just tabled. Okay. This evening, because yeah, it's not something which I think um, needs a an immediate reply. But no, no. okay, that's fine. To to on it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's fine, Cathy. Thank you very much for that. Yes. Stephen Perry. Yeah, I actually had a different point, but I just want to say I, I absolutely totally support what Cathy said, and uh, that was behind some of the hesitation we had in just having a, a lone voice in terms of communication. So whatever we can do with Cathy, with the with the local authority, we'd like we'd delight to support. I had a slightly different question, and I don't wish to put Andrew uh, Blackburn on the spot, but <laughs> having seen him for the first time, uh, perhaps Andrew you could just give us an outline of, of your role and how you see it developing, because it seems that such an excellent opportunity for those of us that are interested in that to get some insight. So please don't feel in the in the spotlight, but it would be helpful if you're willing just to give us some insight. Thank you. Sandu. I think you might be muted. I've got a double mute system just to, uh, <laughs> so I don't put my foot in it. So um, uh, firstly, thank you for inviting me. Um, secondly, very impressed by the presentations. Thirdly, to answer the question, um, I'm still finding my feet. You know, hopefully it's not a, a wishy-washy answer. Um, taking on board all the various things that are happening, um, as you might appreciate, we've got the different groups tonight, uh, you know, um, as individual um, parties coming together. And then I've got my other um, bits um, that I do today. I was in EV meetings. Uh, was actually in a welcome to the council meeting. I'm that fresh and green um, this morning. So, um, you know, the, my role is a response to the climate change and, um, you know, the agendas that you're seeking um, actions on. Um, as to what my, uh, you know, to put words on the, my day to day and outputs and, um, other kind of corporate agendas I couldn't really say at the moment other than my job description and I'm finding my feet um, and hopefully that doesn't sound um, ominous um, simply I wouldn't want to say I'm doing x y and z when actually I'm doing a b c and x y and z or not doing z <laughs> well I'd just like to say you're very welcome Andrew and I wish all you all whatever support we can give you it's there for the asking or for the taking <laughs> thank you no, um, no, thank you very much. I, I will most certainly um, take you probably all the groups up on their offers of, of further understanding, further information, um, you know, and further collaboration. So yeah, I look forward to, um, you know, the forwards and onwards. Indeed. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, John, John Beckett. Uh, Garfield, um, I was intrigued and pleased to hear some of the things you were talking about in reference to public transport services and uh, it flagged up a, a thought that I did discuss with David Beer um, shortly before he went and that's the issue of whether we should be collecting data on public transfer transport needs right across uh, the CWAC area and uh, if, if you look at the sort of things that he says we need to be doing and if you look at it rate it in importance public transport in terms of its impact on uh, the climate emergency it's the single most important thing we're doing we, we've lost our lead individual david beer and we, we're working in your area which is terrific but i'm aware that there's no work in southeast chester we haven't actually gone out to our populations in all of the parishes to say what do you perceive public trans transport improvements need to be and how on earth can we put a national bus strategy needs together uh, by October if we haven't got something like that. So I say to myself, I wonder whether we should be doing it right across CWAC now. I think an initial answer to you, John, is that the the Rural Mobility Fund is funding this particular survey along with the Community Rail Network, mm. which covers that particular area. So in other words, they're both geographi geographically bound, yes, uh, by the funding that they're receiving. So that's the first answer. But I mean, if the, if the information that we're getting from the survey um, 
is is good quality and we found that it is useful i think we'll extend it i think the council yeah. will be very sensible in extending that to other uses regardless of whether it's funded by um rmf awards um, yeah. but initially we have to do that because that's where it's funded for the, the, the costs are not very large you know for a no, thousand no. people it might just cost 200 pounds really to mail shot everybody in Christleton. Yeah. And you'd give them an online survey and we'd find out and you could do that right across the CWAC area. So yeah. I should just leave you with that thought. OK, no, well, I think that's a, that's a good thought. And hopefully this trial will give us whether or not the questions we've been asking are the right ones. OK, thank you. Thanks, John. Alex. I was just wondering, um, is the Walk, Ride, Thrive consultation the council carried out in the summer being used by the subgroups? Ooh, I don't know. I don't know that at all. Does anybody present have any information on that? OK, I'll take that as a tabled question then, Alex. Andrew, you got anything there? No. No, OK, you just popped up on my screen. I wondered if you were going to say something. OK, I'll take that as a tabled question then, Alex. And we'll Sorry, Garfield, I was going to add um, just to my previous wish you want to. I have a meeting um, regarding the Walk, Thrive, Ride uh, next week um, oh, right. to get to the bottom of it and, um, you know, to understand a bit more about it. Um, so unfortunately, no more to add, but hopefully in the next meeting there will be information. OK, that's great. Thanks. We'll have a note of that, so we will come back to these questions at the next meeting. OK, thank you. Mike, Mike Garrett. Yeah, Barry, just back to what uh, John was talking about there about data. Uh, there is a bias here, isn't there? I was able to use um, motorised origin destination data. The old county council did collect data on public transport ridership. The present authority doesn't. So again, if you don't have the, the data, it's a bit difficult to make cases. So I, that's that's not so much an attitude survey as just simple movement data. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I mean, we won't have data on the actual, you know, where people have been going to. What we're asking people for is what they would like. So there is a difference. Um, so, uh, Christy. Well, there is a difference, I know, but without that basic data, you don't know where to start from. Uh, well, we're, we're going to ask the whole area of so what they want to do with um, their particular forms of transport. So I think that's that's the area that we're starting with. Uh, Christy. Um, I was just going to round off a few points, I guess, really. Um, publicity for the Sustainable Transport Task Force Group generally does go out on a bit of a press release on our social media. Um, but I don't I hold my hands up. I don't think that happened on this particular occasion. But yes, we do acknowledge we need to do more. I'm looking at the website aspect that you raised. Um, in terms of um, bus um, usage um, and um, surveys, um, I think as part of the National Bus Strategy, um, obviously the government's quite keen that we um, undertake bus service implement um, bus service improvement plans. Um, and I think, you know, as part of that process, we will need to do some wider consultation as a borough as a whole. So I'm wondering whether the, you know, that's that's an authority ask as well, rather than, you know, maybe um, uh, passing it to the, to the subgroups. I think it might be more informed by um, working together on that one really as well. Um, and the last point about the data, then we, we just monitor the, the services that we um, we fund at this point in time. So we've only got 7% of the network that's commercial, but over 93% is, is run by the operators and, and the data they, they hold is their own. Um, obviously, we work with them, but some of it is commercially sensitive. But um, but yeah, just to round off a few points, really, but I, I appreciate we need to come back to you with more, more detail. And then I'm thinking um, also in respect of, of the, the question to Andrew about, you know, the work areas, I think it's probably prudent in, in the revision of the terms of reference if there's a um, you know, periodically not to take away from the work that the sub subgroups are doing, but whether it's worth the council, you know, giving you an update on some of the projects that have been completed, whether they're active travel or whatever, that kind of can can update you on what we're doing as well, because I think it's probably just a one-way street at the moment, isn't it, really? So that was it, really. Yeah, thanks, Christy. I think that would be very useful. Yeah. Mike, is that a fresh hand? Or... Yeah, and just very briefly, Christy, the, the meeting we had with Stagecoach suggested they would be prepared to... Uh, to share data. Oh, that's good. That's a great. That's that's something to to cheer about. So thank you. 
and they, they don't want thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds in order to do so. <laughs> they just want us to get on their buses, that's all. <laughs> yeah, oh, yes, I, I would agree with that. OK, thank you very much indeed. Um, no further questions. So um, we're down to item 10, any other business? I've not nothing notified to me and I have none of my own. So we'll move on to um, closing the meeting. I just want to point out something which um, has kind of struck me as I went through the, the various slides this evening. There must be something like 50 people engaged across these projects. Probably a little more, actually, if you take um, Andy Farrell's subgroups that break down his own group. I think there must be probably 50, 60 people working on these particular pilot studies at the moment. And they're all quite, I would say, intense and committed and enthusiastic. That's a that's a huge volunteer pool. And I think my message really at the end of this to to my council colleagues is we there's a there's a pool of people here who are willing to work on these particular projects. So by working together, we can actually make and get the best out of them and get the best out of the projects and do exactly what the STTF says on the tin. So that's my hope. So thank you everybody for sparing the time tonight and um, I wish you all well. Thank you, bye bye. Thank you. Thanks everyone, bye. Thank you, bye. appreciate that, bye. 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 Thank you everyone, bye now. Bye everybody. I think Will's still online, but it's okay. I don't mind that. Yeah, yeah I didn't that's know fine. if we we're going to have a little bit of a uh, a debrief afterwards. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's fine. What we, it's what we usually I'll do. Just, uh, I'll stop the video if I can remember how to do it now. Sorry, because I think that's um, everyone's left, so stop recording. There we go. Stop. There we go.